Galatians chapter 6. We'll start in verse 11 and read through verse 18. See what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Father, Lord, once again, Your Word is before us. And we put no confidence in the flesh to think that we would benefit from this in any way. But by Your Holy Spirit coming and helping. And so we, we ask You, Holy Spirit, to come and change us through these words. Give us understanding at such a level that it changes us in our minds and our hearts and that it would result in a change of life so that you would get more glory from our lives. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do this through the preaching of your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, oftentimes, uh, just looking around, I see you know, a few new people. I feel like it's helpful to, to say a few things about preaching uh, before we kind of get into this. And even if you're, you know, you're here every week and it's helpful to get these reminders, uh, I, I like to hear why a preacher or a teacher teaches the way they do. Uh, I find that, that helpful. Um, there was an old popular quote. Uh, it's, it's been accredited to Charles Spurgeon uh, a lot, but From what I've heard, Spurgeon uh, scholars can't even necessarily pin this to him. But he said, take your text and make a beeline to the cross. And that sounds really gospel-centered. And and many people say, well, that's how you preach. And and, and that is a a blueprint for many on what makes a good preacher. Um, But... I do think there, uh, there, is a lot, there are a lot of preachers, uh, even in our circles, trying to follow that method, and they're flattening the actual text, and how could I say this, um, flattening the diverse beauties of a particular text by trying to make everything crescendo in the cross. And when I say the cross, I don't, I don't mean... Uh, the ways the the scriptural authors build it out holistically. I I mean, a a type of preaching that tries to work a sermon, work a passage, always into one doctrine, substitutionary atonement. And it's all in the name of being gospel-centered. And and, uh, I I heard a pushback this week. I bring this up because I heard John Piper kind of push back on this and said something that I thought was helpful. Uh, He said, rather than taking your text and making a beeline to the cross, we should take the cross and make a beeline to the text. And, And so essentially what he was saying, to quote him again, he says, build a sermon. He said, instead of building a sermon toward the cross, build it on the cross. And I think that's what Paul's doing. For the Galatian church, he's building on the cross. 
Uh, you got to remember the context here. Paul is writing to these Galatian churches and kind of scattered there are a few churches, he, and it's about 15 years after the actual death of Christ on the cross. I mean, most scholars, it's, it's very agreed upon that 48 AD-ish is when this was written. Do the math, that's about 15 years from when Christ was crucified. I mean, to put that in our, in our terms, that would be like some, talking about something that happened in 2005. It's really not that long ago. So, so think back with me, church. Go back, let's put ourselves as these Galatian Christians and go back 15 years in the upper room with Jesus on the night that he died. And, and we're about to take the supper. You know, Jesus took the bread and the drink and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As if to hold it before these men and say, this is everything now. The, the body and the blood that I will lay down for you in a moment, uh, in a few hours, is everything. And then he's, the, the story unfolds, the night unfolds, they, they leave that room and they go to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane and they're interrupted. Jesus is interrupted by praying from a kiss of a betrayer who would hand him over to a corrupt government and he would be unjustly tried by this government. The most unjust sentencing ever because he was perfectly innocent and he would go to his death, silent, not arguing, not defending himself. He would take the beatings, he would carry his cross, he would stretch out his hands to be pierced, just so bloodied, almost unrecognizable. And then he would hang there. He, he hung there. And he hung there, and then he prayed a, a God-like, gracious prayer for the people doing this to him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He knew why he came. He knew there was only one way. It was that he would lay down his life and die our death so that He could then give us His life. He knew why He came. And He died under the wrath of His Father. And He was buried. And three days later, He rose. And He appeared over the course of 40 days to over 500 eyewitnesses before ascending back to heaven where He is today ruling and reigning as God over all. This really happened. We really believe this is a, a historical event. And, and the way that we feel about this event and the way that we think about this event is everything for us. It is everything for you. How you think about and feel about that death. What happened on that old dirt hill outside Jerusalem to that man in that location at that point in history is everything. The cross of Christ is where everything in, everything in history converges. All of the eternal purposes of God converge and, and, and come together in the cross of Christ. And here's, here's what I think we need to see jumping into this passage and what Paul has to say about it. You know, Paul has said this already in Galatians and, and uh, Jesus said it in the Gospel of John. And it is this. One of the biggest reasons many won't be saved by Christ isn't because they're so pagan and atheistic. It isn't, and this is the same reason many church people won't be saved by Christ. It is because they are ashamed of the persecution that the cross brings. They're ashamed of it. This is what the, the Judaizers' problem in verse 12, it says, uh, it is those who want to make a, a good showing in the flesh 
who would force you to be circumcised. And here it is. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. This is why so many will not be saved. Because they know they're going to lose friendships over it. They know they can't just watch any and everything. They know lifestyle choices will change. Many, in many countries, uh, parents may turn on you. You may be disowned by your family. Even here, many family and friends won't like you anymore when you become a Christian. I lost all my friends when I became a Christian. Even though I tried to keep them, they didn't want me. Many know that following Christ will conflict with many things in our life. And so they don't, they're, they're ashamed. And, and what's up underneath that shame? It is, it is pride and it is a, a love of the praise of man. That's, what, that's what's happening here in this text. Look back at verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing, good showing in the flesh, who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. It's self-preservation. And verse 13, for, for even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. If you love the praise of man and people's approval, you'll never hold to the truth. If you need to feel accepted, you will continually compromise and cave and sell out to avoid persecution or to avoid a ruined relationship with somebody you care about. Why? Because you still care about people's approval more than you care about God's approval. And Paul is calling the church to another path. One that is not popular. One that often brings persecution and is very offensive. Guys, do, do, we, re do we realize how offensive the cross actually is? You know, a faithful spouse, the cross says a faithful spouse who's been faithful uh, their whole marriage is just as guilty as the spouse who commits adultery repeatedly. That before God, they're equally guilty. That's what the cross means. It, it, the cross means that the faithful employee who's never stolen, lied, at work, cheated on their taxes is just as guilty as the person who's living large because they did cheat and they did lie to work themselves up. They're both equally guilty before God. That's what the cross means. It, it, it means that the faithful citizen who's been civil and loving and respectful and kind and doesn't break the law is just as guilty before God as the person right now rioting in the streets, breaking the law, cursing. They're both equally guilty before God. Do you see how offensive that is? It's offensive to the world. They don't believe that. And it's certainly offensive to many in church or religious. This is what Paul said about the Gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.18 The cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then verse 22, he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, so how is this, this cross that's a, a stumbling block to the rebellious that's that's or foolishness to the rebellious, that's a stumbling block to the religious. How does this offensive cross become our source of boasting? It tells us, the Bible repeatedly tells us to boast in the Lord and to boast in His cross. Why? 
Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. He says this, Christ has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. So you say, I have a little bit of righteousness. I have a little bit of wisdom. I think I'm being sanctified. I'm righteous. I'm, I'm redeemed. And then Paul goes, it's a gift. All of it is a gift. Your righteousness is a gift. It's Christ. Your sanctification, your redemption, all of it is a gift. All of it is grace. So that you will boast in the Lord and not yourself. I mean, Christians don't have a problem with boasting. That word kind of turns us off sometimes. We think, oh, that's prideful. No, it's okay to boast. Christians, there's no problem between Christianity and boasting. The question is, who or what are you boasting in? You want to brag about something? You want to boast in something? Boast in the fact that everything good you have is from Christ. And understand that it is not only everything you have is in Christ, but everything you could want is in Christ. Because this word boasting actually... uh, the way in Paul's understanding of the word boasting, I think it's a very happy act of the soul. It's a happy act of the of the soul. You aren't it, look. You can't boast in Christ by going, okay, boast in Christ. It's there in the text. I guess I need to try to do that. I'm not really doing that. I should try to boast. It, that's not boasting. You, you don't you don't just do this. This is a this is a a a posture of the heart that you can't just make happen. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a happy thing. It's a glad thing. It's, it's something that is, has emotion to it. I, I say this because of 2 Corinthians 12.9. Listen to how Paul says this. I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. So Paul, there's something about boasting that often accords with gladness, a type of contentedness, a type of happiness. So in order to do what Paul is doing here and boast in the cross, there's got to be something that when we think about the cross of Christ and his death and what that means for us, something in the heart happens so that boasting happens. It's not something the devil can do. It's not something the world can do. And think about this man, Paul, who's doing this. This isn't man. I mean, he could lift up his shirt, tunic, or whatever he's wearing, and show you these scars. He calls them marks. They're bragging about circumcision. He's like, you want to see real marks for Christ? I'm slashed to pieces for Christ. And and you think, why would this man keep doing this to himself? Everywhere he goes, he preaches about the cross and he gets persecuted. You would think eventually he would go, you know what? These Judaizers, they're also talking about Jesus. And then they're talking about the law also. And morality and all of this. They're saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then they're also teaching the law and they're not getting persecuted. But they're leaving out the cross. And he goes, verse 14, he says, By no means will I ever boast or teach anything but the cross of Christ. I'm not going to avoid persecution and leave out the cross. He says, by, he, he says, may it never be. That phrase right there, it's a double negative in the Greek. It's saying, never ever. Never would I ever. We don't really use double negatives in English often. Uh, the, the New King James, if anybody has that translation, it says, God forbid that I would boast except in the cross. He's emphatic about this. He, he's drawn a line in the sand. He's saying, I will not boast about anything but the cross. And in our pluralistic, everybody's beliefs are equally valid culture, it's probably worth pointing out a simple and profound truth. He doesn't say, I'll boast in the cross, 
and I'll boast in these other things also that are equally valid and important. He says, I will boast in nothing except the cross. And I I really don't think a lot of Christians understand what he's saying. Because we, we often are like, well, I believe in the cross. I believe in the cross, but I boast in homeschooling. I believe in the cross, but, but our boast is in our conservative values. We believe in the cross, but our boast is in our ability to not fall into that sin and to, well, I had my devotion today. You know, it, se- it seems to me that many Christians find it easier to boast in the cross on their best days. You know, the day you didn't get upset and say something you shouldn't have. The day you didn't look at the thing you shouldn't have. The day that you didn't fall into whatever sin. If you're only able to boast in the cross on your best days, I don't know if you yet understand the cross. The the real proof that we have understood the cross is that on our worst days, we find ourselves boasting in it even more. Because we're laying there going, this is my only hope, what you accomplished 2,000 years ago. It's it. This is my refuge. And Paul's saying to these churches, I don't know if you get it yet. Going back to 1 Corinthians 1.30, he says, because of Him, the Lord, you are in Christ. He's saying, because of the Lord, you are in the Lord, who has become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He says, even your righteousness, even the good things you do are in the Lord, are from the Lord, therefore boast in the Lord. In your bad days, because of His grace. In your good days, because of His grace. It's all the Lord. The cross is not something we can put in a, you know, a conjunctive relationship with anything else. It's, it's not a, a spoke in the, in the wheel of Christianity. The cross is the center, the hub in which all the spokes come out of. It is the center. I, you know, if I were going to plant a church, I'd probably call it the Cross Church. <laughs> it's a good name. It's central to what we're about. But it's very watered down, isn't it? I mean, it's very hard to actually, you have to really kind of think when you say the word cross, you have to kind of think and put your mind there because it's so watered down. You see it on people's necklaces, you see it on shirts and clothes. And Before I was a Christian, I got it tattooed on my arm. <laughs> I mean, you just see it all over the place. And it's hard to actually think about what they thought about when they heard boast in the cross. I mean, put yourself there. Ancient Rome. Paul going, I'm boasting in the cross. You'd be like, what? And if you named your church that back then, if you named your church the cross church back in, you know, ancient Rome, it would be, this would how it would sound to our ears. It would be like hearing a, driving on the road and being like, no, a new church, cool. Lethal injection church, you know. Firing squad church. It just sounds crazy. This is, a, this is an ancient mode of torture that the, that the Persians came up with and then the Romans kind of perfected. And you read historians on this, they would actually line up Roman uh, criminals on the side of these roads, miles and miles. They said there are thousands of them at times. You could just walk and see people being eaten by birds, rotting, hanging from crosses. Thousands. And it was to keep the Romans from revolting. It was kind of a sign of power by the government to say, don't you dare revolt. Look what we can do. 
This was not a noble thing to die on a cross. This is a barbaric, horrible thing reserved for the worst criminals. And it, not even culturally back then was it a, a sign of shame, but even biblically, it was a curse. Remember Deuteronomy 21-23? Hundreds of years before the crucifixion, listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 21-23. It says, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him at the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. And then Paul quotes that passage from Deuteronomy 21-23 in Galatians 3.13. Remember this? And he says, Cursed is everyone who is hanged in a tree as it is written. And he's quoting that passage from Deuteronomy. But then what Paul does is he connects it to Jesus and says, and Jesus was cursed on our behalf. On that tree. The cross of Christ. So if somebody says, oh, you go to cross church. Say, no, 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 that's something else. I go to the cross church. Because <laughs> there's a lot of crosses out there, but there's only one cross that, that we boast in. It is the cross where the Son of Man, also the Son of God, was slaughtered and put to death upon. The cross. That's the one we care about. That's the one we build our lives around. That's the one we boast in. That's the one we sing songs about. That's the one we go to the table every week and remember. Those songs, I wrote down a few songs. At the cross. Near the cross. The old rugged cross. The wonderful cross. Hallelujah for the cross. We, we sing the power of the cross. Isaac Watts wrote that really popular hymn in 1707 called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. That's very strange to sing about when you really think about it. But we don't believe it's mythical or sentimental or artistic. We believe the cross is historical and real. Something really happened on that cross that isn't just nice to think about, but affects my life for eternity and anyone else who truly understands what happened there and receives what happened there. So look, you, you're not going to boast in the cross like Paul's doing here unless you at least get a, a few theological things right about it. So, so when you hear people say, for example, you know, faith, family, and football, that's what Christianity, you know, it's like, that's kind of what I'm going for with Christianity. You're going to have to do better than that. You know, or it's like, well, we're, the main thing is just not to, to, uh, to do works, but uh, to be saved, but to believe. You, we, it's all about our faith. It's all about my faith. You hear that language, my faith. That's not what Christianity is all about. Many people, when they say things like that, they're turning faith into a work anyway. As if it's like, okay, I've got to, there's salvation over there, and I've got to really try hard to believe in Jesus so that I can be saved. And they just turn faith into a work, something they have to do to be saved. That's not what the Bible means by faith. Faith is basically when we stop trying hard to be saved, and then we just fall upon Christ trusting fully in what He's done, and He saves us. It's not something you do. It's, it's just fully trusting in what He has done for us. So this is the legitimate question that I think we should all ask of this text. How does someone legitimately boast in the cross of Christ alone? And here's what Paul's not going to tell us. He's not going to give us something that we should do. He's, gonna, he's going to tell us about something that has happened to us. That's how he answers that. Here, here's what it's saying. Someone will boast in the cross only when two, we'll call them, spiritual realities have happened to them. 
You will boast in the cross. I will boast in the cross when two spiritual realities have happened to us. And, and the first one is in verse 14. He says, he talks about boasting in the cross. I will not boast in anything except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, for which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What tense is that? Future tense, like, oh, you got to do this? No. Past tense, it's already happened. I have been crucified. It already has happened. It's amazing news because the world, 1 John says the world is passing away. You want to be crucified to the world. You want to be dead to the world. If you don't die with Christ to the world, you will die apart from Christ with the world. If we had time, we could go to Romans 6 and build this out in more detail. Because in Romans 6, Paul begins to say that the, divide, the decisive blow to what is in us that still loves the world and the things in the world died when we died with Christ. The moment of conversion, something died in me that disconnects me from the world. I'm still drawn to many things in the world. It's not like I'm just completely out of this world, but something happened at conversion that I died to the world and the world died to me. So how does somebody die to the world or die to self? Same thing. How does that happen? Galatians 2.20 says this. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Same, same language. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live, here it is, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me on the cross. That faith connecting me to that 2,000 year ago event supernaturally and imparting to me a death so that I die with Him and a life so that I live with Him by faith. This is why um, someone, somebody asked uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones one time, or, or I'm sorry, some, he would ask people, uh, are you a Christian? And if someone would respond, yeah, I'm trying to be, he would, he would say, well, they clearly have no idea what a Christian is. Because anybody who's trying to become one isn't one. And then he said this, you can't become a Christian through trying. You can only become a Christian through dying. Jesus dying for you, and then you dying to self and the world. Another theologian said, the glorious meaning of the death of Jesus Christ is that when He died, all His own died with Him. And that's not something you can make happen. It's supernatural. It's a result of faith and the working of the Holy Spirit. So let me say it like this. It's a careful statement. I read this to Priscilla last night. I don't know if she found it helpful or not, but hopefully this is helpful. This is a supernatural reality that happens when we truly understand and embrace the cross and we truly understand and embrace the cross when the supernatural reality happens to us. Maybe I should read that again. This is a supernatural reality that happens when we truly understand and embrace the cross, and we truly understand and embrace the cross when the supernatural reality happens to us. It always goes together. Truly Seeing and embracing what Christ did on the cross in a saving way happens because of the Spirit's work in me. And when the Spirit works in me, I see Jesus rightly and see the cross rightly and can boast in the cross truly. So look at it in the passage. 
Verse 14, see the flow. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So look at the flow here. Boasting in the cross, boasting only in the cross, happens when we have died to the world and the world has died to us, and that is a result of the new creation. And if one happens to you, all of them happen. So one thing we need to make sure that we get about Christianity, just to bring this down a little, hopefully clearer. Uh, Christianity is not just about affirming that Jesus really did die 2,000 years ago on a cross and then rose again. It is affirming that as a historical reality, reality and then experiencing the reality in ourselves of a type of death and a type of life. It's not just affirming the historical reality of Jesus' death and resurrection. It is ourselves experiencing with Christ a dying and a rising. And this is how Paul talks about it. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Listen to how he says this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Same language. The old has passed away. The old has died. Behold, the new has come. So look. Christianity is, is, it really is more about something that's happened to you than it is something you need to do. And I'm hoping when I say that, you remember the sermon from last week on good works. We're not downplaying good works and love. But Christianity really is more about something that has been done to you than something you still need to do. It's not mainly a list of things you do, but mainly someone you behold, namely Christ, dying and rising. It's not mainly a list of things you do, but something you experience, namely you die with Christ and rise with Him to newness of life. And it doesn't say that newness of life looks like you floating up into heaven. It says that newness of life is something you, you walk in the newness of life. So I'll close uh, with, with application. Uh, what do you do? And I want to just close out the letter here because this is we're going to end Galatians. Guys, some of you really struggle with this. A sense of guilt. Maybe shame would be a good word for it. Where you, where, you, where you just kind of live under the displeasure of God, or so you feel. Like, once I finally get my act together and stop doing such and such, then I can enter into God's favor. What does this text say? Verse 17. For all who walk by this rule. What does that mean? What is the rule? You could translate it as standard. Is he talking about a walking according to a perfect standard of obedience with no failure ever? No. Who would qualify? What is the rule or standard? Is he talking about the law? That's a perfect standard, right? No. The whole letter of Galatians is clearly saying the standard that we're to live by is not the law. What is the rule? He says, verse 17, for all who Walk by this rule, this standard. And I believe what he's referring back to is for all who boast only in the cross. For all who have died with Christ to the world because you've experienced a new creation in Him. For all who walk by this rule, what will happen to you? Peace from God. Mercy from God will be upon them, it says. But you've got to answer the question, are you walking according to the rule, to the standard? This rule of boasting in the cross. This, this rule of being dead to the world because we are living for another. This rule of 
experiencing the new creation? If so, peace and mercy be upon you. Brothers and sisters, I I hope you hear the word you there. This is personal. This is personal. Look at verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Not the grace of a different Jesus. A lot of people say Jesus. But the grace of the one and only full title, Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What could be better? I don't know. What could you hear? What could, what could I say to you right now that would be better than grace, mercy, and peace being upon you? And it is if you walk according to the rule. What is the rule? The boasting and the cross. The being dead to the world because we've found another world. the new creation that we walk in. How could we boast in anything except the cross? Let's pray. Father, Lord, no eloquent prayers. We just want to be a people that boasts in the cross. We want to walk according to this rule. We want this to be the ultimate treasure of our heart. You and what you've accomplished for us. And so, Father, I pray that if there's some here who have never let go of all their performance and works, a baptism, a prayer, a a thing they did, Lord, I pray they would let loose of that, trusting it, and they would cling to the cross and to the cross alone. And Lord, for those of us here who the cross is our boast, Lord, help us us to boast more. Help us to boast more, Lord. Use the table today. Help us to go out from here clinging more than ever to the cross of your Son. And we pray this in His name.